But my theme today is to talk about lessons from disasters looking for a new way to learn. And as Mark uh, pointed out, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by training, and my work has been very much on the letter of the law, but that is not today's theme. I'm not going to sit here and take us through the Royal Commissions Act or any other one. This is much more a critique of them. And uh, it's not, uh, my critique and my position is not unaffected by my experiences as a legal practitioner. I mean, one of the reasons I became an academic was I was sitting in courtrooms one day thinking this is a complete waste of everybody's time. Why on earth do we do this? There has to be a better way. That's developed as I've come through uh, working in this field to the, to the ideas, and they are just ideas that I want to um, put forward tonight. And of course, I'm going to have a, a reasonably, if not predominant, Australian focus, but the, what I'm going to talk about will be, I hope, uh, universally applicable. So when I say something like this, after every disaster there's an inquiry, um, I don't think, even though I come from the Australian background, that I'm telling you anything that you would disagree with. There's always an inquiry. But what do we learn from them? And more importantly, we might learn issues about that event. The classic question is always, you know, what happened here? What are we going to do about this? But of course, the next event won't be the same. As I say, in, again, in the Australian context, where our mate, one of our major hazards is bushfires, strangely enough, the next bushfire isn't going to read the inquiry and behave the same way. And so how transferable are the lessons? So this, these last three questions here, what I want to think about and suggest an approach, and I'm interested in people's ideas about whether what I'm about to say actually sounds like it makes sense, that might answer these questions appropriately so that we come up with lessons that, yes, can be applied in the next event, do involve the whole community, and stop people being surprised. Not stop the next disaster, just means that when the next flood or bushfire comes, people aren't suddenly going, oh my God, how could this have happened? Instead of going, yeah, we know that happens. You know, if you live in rural Victoria and you don't think you're going to face a bushfire, something's going wrong. Not that not in the response that we're going to stop the bushfires, but something's going wrong and that you haven't understood that if you're going to choose to live in rural Victoria, Australia, you're going to face a bushfire. You know? Nothing is going to stop that. Yet every time we have one, someone goes, how could this have happened? Um, uh, I've been asked to I wander around a bit. I do wander a bit, but I have to keep coming back to my... Um, my slides to remember what I'm going to say next. That's right. So, so they're the question. What, what I'm going to propose to you today is just some ideas that might be adopted in post-event inquiries that will help answer these questions in the appropriate way. And just as a bit of a segue, we ask these questions, and this is the you know acknowledgement to my sponsors. We were funded. Uh, my colleague, who his name doesn't appear there, Professor Dovers and I were. were funded by the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. The CRC is a cooperative research centre. It's a research scheme in Australia that involves research institutions, universities, and uh, end users. For the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC, the end users are all the Australian Fire and Emergency Services. And so they all come together, uh, develop the research agenda, and, uh, and fund the research. And we were funded by, by them to, to do this work, which has led to this discussion paper, which is the subject of tonight's talk. So there's appropriate acknowledgement to the sponsors. So now let's talk about various types of inquiries. There are lots of them. They have different words depending on your jurisdiction and your legislation, but these words will all sound familiar to you. You know, you have the, the very standard internal agency review. You've had a fire or a flood or a, whatever it is, whatever the response agencies are, they're going to stop and go, well, how did we go? You might have operational reviews, a bit bigger, someone's brought in to look at the whole response. We have special inquiries, often under pre current existing legislation, so uh, the Bushfires Act or the Civil Contingencies Act or whichever act you're operating on might have a provision somewhere that says the minister can arrange for an inquiry and on they go. Then you have royal commissions and the coroners. And the inquiries I want to talk about tonight are those last two. Coroners, as you would 
uh, I'm sure understand. It, it, the, the office of coroner is one of the most ancient offices in uh, English law. Dates back to, I can't remember when, but an awfully long time ago. We've had coroners for a long time investigating deaths. The story is that, uh, from my legal history lectures, that if a body was found, you know, the local village had to pay some sort of taxes, so you had to have the coroner to work out who, where the body came from and who they were, so you could work out how much the Crown was going to get. I'm probably making that up, but the coroners have been around for a very long time. So coroners have this standing jurisdiction to investigate, generally speaking, deaths and fires. Again, depending on your jurisdiction, they may, you know, may have been tweaked a bit, but that's the historical jurisdiction of the coroner, deaths and fires. So, of course, in the disaster management, emergency management, they're right in there. Royal commissions, again, really historic. The monarch would, would commission someone um, to do an inquiry, often a public policy inquiry. You know, we're going to have to make some new laws. Where we want to know where, how the system's working. But they've shifted, and they've become more and more uh, a forensic inquiry, a truth-finding mission. And I use that term liberally. Uh, so they're now coming into things like post-disasters. From the Australian experience, we have, uh, I, I hope you're familiar, if you're not, I can give you some more details, but we have the 2009 Victorian Black Saturday bushfires, uh, February 2009, killed 173 people. You know, within days, we have a royal commission appointed to investigate the entire preparation for and response to the bushfires. Um, in 2011, there's major flooding in Queensland, in Brisbane, the northernmost uh, capital. I mean, no great surprise, they had a great big flood in 74. They used to have markers on the walls that said this is where the flood level got up to. They've been taking them down. And then, of course, the 2000 floods came and people go, oh, we didn't know that could happen. Well, that little blue line that was on the wall <laughs> might have been a giveaway. But anyway, we have a royal commission following that event. So the royal commissions get called after the big things. You know, your average fire doesn't trigger a royal commission. 173 people dead, you get a royal commission. So why do we get them? Now, the next couple of points that I want to make are not talking about coroners. Remember, coroners, coroners have their own jurisdiction, their own legislation. They will hold an inquiry when they need to investigate uh, the death. Traditionally, their job was to identif identify the deceased and the cause of their death, and uh, then got added on a power to make recommendations to avoid future situations. Royal Commission's much broader. The next couple of points are about Royal Commissions. Why do we have them? Well, we might hope that we have them to learn lessons from the event that will help improve the community resilience and the effectiveness of the response, or some such nice phrase. But the literature tells us that, you know, there's a lot more to it. They're established for politically expedient reasons. They show concern about an issue. So if governments are faced with something like 173 people dead, they can't just go, no, it was a bad day, wasn't it? They have to be much more concerned. In fact, I was standing uh, in an audience of King Lake. King Lake was one of the worst towns affected by the bushfires. And I actually raised the question. I said, is 173 dead evidence of failure or evidence of success? I mean, that, were, that was a really bad day. Did you see how big the fire was? Only 173 people died. Surely that's good news. I got out of there alive, <laughs> just, but I thought it was a fair question to ask. Because, uh, of course, the whole thing out of the Black Saturday fires was this was a terrible failure. But was it? I mean, a lot more people, a lot of people didn't die. I might add, I'll go off on a, on a side point there. We then wrote a paper, uh, I have a co-author, Professor Dovers, and I've done a lot of this work together. We wrote a, co a paper on what are the measures of success in emergency management. And our argument was to the chief officers, if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, you can't stand up at the next Royal Commission and say, actually, we did pretty well. Um, and, and I take some credit that the, the, the chief officers of the Australian Fire and Emergency Services then put out a, a position statement on what their measures of success are and they, they, they change their public messaging much more these days to say, yes, this was bad, but, but this is what didn't happen. You know, we, we lost this, but the fire was impacting a community of this size. We only lost X number of houses out of a potential. Um, I take some credit for that. Anyway, so where am I? To give an illusion of action. We're trying to do, well, obviously we're doing something. We've called a Royal Commission. Show responsiveness to a problem. Co-op the critics. Oh, we're having an inquiry, you know. Stop attacking us. Go and give evidence to the inquiry. 
I love this one. Delay decision making. Reassert control of the policy agenda. Delay decision making. They can all, governments can always go, can't do anything, we're waiting for the inquiry. And equally, shut down criticism. I can't answer that question. The matter's before the inquiry. By the time it comes out of the inquiry, you'll have all forgotten and moved on anyway. So holding the inquiry, and, and I, I actually thought some of that was obvious when they called the 2009 bushfires inquiry, particularly the one about just shutting down the whole debate. It just, you know, there were going to be lots of voices of complaint and you just, we've taken this very seriously, we've hauled our Royal Commission, please go and give your evidence, I can't comment. And it just dropped out of the media as a, as a political story. Now, I don't mean to say that the government wasn't actually interested in what they learned out of the Royal Commission and lots came out of it, but there's no denying that there's more to it than just a desire to find the truth. Or as someone else said, it's not the inherent severity of an event, but rather the interplay of the politics, blame, public agenda and government popularity that determines the choice of whether to establish a commission of inquiry. If you're a government with a really solid majority and a really solid government that everyone's, you know, singing to the right songbook and sufficiently disciplined, it's much easier to avoid calls for royal commissions uh, than other ones. So the thesis that I'm putting to you is... But these things aren't solely motivated by uh, simply a recognition that something bad has happened and we've got to learn from it. And there's another agenda which may or not, may not be conscious. It may or may not be in the hearts of the government, but if anyone's seen these things, we know that it comes true, which is we've got to find someone to blame. It's got to be someone's fault. Because, uh, again, you know, I put quotes in here just to show I'm not, you know, I don't make this up. There's literature out this, you know, like good researchers. Fantasies of omnipotence and control. Governments need to assure their communities that they're in control, we're in charge. If something really bad happened and uh, I think there's no... No, no, that wasn't... I've got another great slide that says, in these days of risk management, you know, no one's just allowed to, ex to accept that just bad things happen. You know, everyone's meant to manage risk, and if we manage risk, we know that it's going to happen. So if, we, if a bad thing happened, whether it's a terrorism event or a bushfire or a flood or a cyber attack, somebody's failed in the risk management aim uh, in these days of the risk management of everything. And so if we can say, well, look, we, we're meant to be in control. It must just be someone got it wrong. If we can just find that person and shoot them, you know, everything will be back in charge. You can trust us. We're in charge. But, says the theory, the apportionment of blame to an individual or human error is a key impediment to organisational learning. So again, the thesis is, if, if that's true, if what these sorts of inquiries do is whether they intend to or not devolve into a situation where either people are being blamed or they feel they're being blamed, you are going to create an impediment to effective learning from the event. Now, I'm a lawyer, I'm not, so this is my background stuff. I haven't gone and proved this, but this is what the literature says, and I'm saying let's accept all that as true. So we have an inquiry like a coroner's inquest or a royal commission. And they hold their extensive inquiries with people coming and giving evidence and making submissions and going through the paperwork. But do they actually help us learn anything? Well, I think it would be wrong to say they don't. Certainly lessons come out of these things. Um, again, if I can use an Australian example, the 1939 Royal Commission into Victorian bushfires um, you know, led to the creation of the Country Fire Authority. There's no doubt having a good Country Fire Authority helped reduce the fatalities in 2009. You know, it had to do something. Lots of learning came out of the 2009 Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission. Some of it the agencies think was really good and some of it everyone goes, oh, really? You think so? I'll come back to that. 
So something comes out of them. There's no, you know, I, I couldn't say they're completely hopeless. That would, be, that would be far too harsh. Certainly learning comes out of them. But here's a quote that will no doubt uh, ring familiar bells to you because it's English. This comes from the Hillsborough Stadium Disaster Inquiry of 1990, not an inquiry that necessarily made itself in glory either, as subsequent inquiries into the inquiries into Hillsborough have said, but it's a good quote. That it was allowed to happen, despite all the accumulated wisdom of so many previous reports and guidelines, must indicate that the lessons of post-disaster had not been taken sufficiently to heart. There is no point in holding inquiries or publishing guidance unless the recommendations are followed diligently. That must be the first lesson. With respect to his honour, there's a lot hidden in that, or at least a lot of assumptions. Because first of all, he assumes that all the previous reports and guidelines and lessons and recommendations actually would have been effective. Secondly, it assumes, uh, well, in the same point really, that if you'd followed them diligently, you may have got a different outcome. And that, I would suggest, is... If you're sitting on the inquiry, you've got to believe that. I mean, if you're the judge, you've got to believe that the inquiry recommendations that you're going to make really would make a difference, otherwise you wouldn't be there. And so you've also got to believe that if people had done those things before, um, it would have made a difference. Because otherwise, what was the point? But there are lots of reasons why I would suggest that that's not true. There are plenty of reasons not to follow recommendations. They're impracticable or impossible. So when a royal commissioner makes a, a recommendation about, I don't know, fixing the radio technology so the radios work in bushfires because every royal commission goes on about how the communications failed, you might go, yeah, well, until someone invents the technology, we're going to struggle with our radios, you know, we've got to cope with the science we've got. So it's a nice recommendation, but, you know, you can't actually do it. Conflicts with other priorities. That's a big one that's come up out of the 2009 Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission. Uh, one of the things that Royal Commission recommended was the development of um, what's been known variously as the 1050 rule or the 2550 rule, depending on how it's been implemented. But the gist of the rule was that uh, if you lived in a bushfire prone area in Australia, you could clear any vegetation within the narrow confine of your house, whether it was 10 metres or 25 metres, it's been tweaked, and any vegetation but trees to the longer one. Uh, but of course, if you're vegetation around your house contained the last known habitat of some rare endangered species, um, people who were interested in the rare endangered species went, hang on, this isn't a good policy, you're going to kill the endangered species. In fact, one of these cases went to court where the gist of the argument was they're not clearing the trees and the vegetation um, for the purposes of bushfire prevention, they're doing it because it will improve the view and secondly, it will allow them to actually build a house with a bigger footprint because they're now no longer encroaching on the vegetation that they've just cleared. And the court said, that might be what they're doing, but the law says they can do it, they can do it and there's nothing you can do to stop them. So, if what you have is a royal commission into how to prevent bushfire loss, you have a rule that says, well, you can just clear all the trees and vegetation. If what you were having was a royal commission into how to prevent perhaps climate change or protect the last known species, you'd have a different rule. And the problem is they don't actually, the royal commissioners don't have to sit there and go, how do these policy implementations impact each other? So the royal commissioner who's looking into floods or fires or terrorism events or whatever it is, comes up with a recommendation and says, well, if you do this, you're going to you know, have a better result, but the government's entitled to go, yeah, but we actually have another policy like trying to preserve the species or whatever it happens to be. So we're not going to adopt your recommendation. So his honours comment that, you know, if you're not going to adopt our recommendation, why bother? Well, maybe it's a fair enough question, but there are other reasons. This is one of my favourite ones. Royal commissioners and coroners don't have to face the budget. I'll tell you a story. I like telling stories. <clears throat> Again, sorry, it's an Australian one. There was a major fire uh, in South Australia. 
Don't you love Australia? We've got such imaginative state names. You know, it's na names of Australia. We've got Victoria named after, sorry, Victoria named after Queen Victoria. Queensland, in honour of the Queen. New South Wales, because they had no imagination. And the other ones are South Australia, Western Australia, and the Northern Territory. And really, nobody was exercising any imagination except the ones that, you know, at least Tasmania got a name. But anyway, I digress. This is in South Australia. It's a major uh, fire. Um, nine people died, I think. Um, as in most bushfires, most of them died trying to get away from the fire too late, died in cars and uh, in the smoke. And there's a big, big coronial inquest into this whole event and the response and the management. And you wonder what, what, you know, what do these things reveal that they didn't already know, but I'll come back to that. But the coroner comes up with this recommendation that the state of South Australia should consider buying an Ericsson Sky Crane helicopter for water bombing. Now, we only have a bushfire season. I mean, it's getting longer, but basically half the year. Do you know what those things cost? I, mean, I don't off the top of my head, but it's a bloody lot of money. I mean, they're really expensive to buy one and run it and have it parked at Adelaide Airport for half a year. But the coroner, of course, can make a recommendation. You should have an Ericsson Sky Crane. And it might be true that if you had an Ericsson Sky Crane and the next bushfire comes along, you're going to be able to better deal with it. But equally, for the cost of buying your Ericsson Sky Crane, you're not going to be able to put firefighters in uniform and put trucks on the ground and do all sorts of other things that governments have to do. So you come up with these recommendations that you can go, well, that's very nice, Your Honour, but are you paying for it? Which is honest, no, I'm not paying for it. That's not my problem. My problem is to come up with recommendations that will help you avoid it again. <clears throat> then we have other recommendations. What if you do follow them, but it just doesn't work? So, for example, one of, the one of the recommendations from the 2009 Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission um, was that steps that have been taken following the 1983 Ash Wednesday fires should be reversed. Uh, they were legislative steps. So after the 1983 fires, there had been recommendations about changing the relevant legislation in Victoria, um, changing the role of the minister, giving the minister a much more direct, hands-on uh, role. Come the 2009 fires, uh, when the minister, of course, goes, I'm the minister, what do I know? I've got fire chiefs. The recommendation is we should change the act to take the minister out of it so the minister doesn't have such a... So, you know, to go back to the quote from His Honour uh, Lord Justice Taylor... Sometimes following the recommendation diligently just doesn't work. You say, yeah, we did it. Didn't actually help. Boom, 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 boom. They reveal new vulnerabilities, the wicked problem. Um, so you follow the recommendations, but it doesn't actually solve the problem because adjusting one thing reveals a future vulnerability and you go, well, we still haven't found the solution. Because well, let's face it, we're never going to. England's going to flood, Australia's going to burn. Um, these things, we live, we live on an unstable planet, hazards are going to happen. And how people respond to them and how we can, and how much money we're prepared to spend in investing them are all sorts of uh, issues. But I'm going to take some time now to say, to give an example of following them, the limited nature of these things. The problem is you have a, a coroner who wants to investigate a death or a fire and come up with recommendations to avoid that death or fire again, or a royal commission who wants to avoid that event happening again. We know that that event is never going to happen again. So they've got to try and take whatever they learn and extrapolate it. And I'm going to tell a story. It's going to take a little while, but it's a good story. And what's more, it involves the UK. So it's a nice, you know, given I've travelled this far, it's a nice comparative story. If I can find it, get the button. It's the story of the sheriff and the coroner. And the sheriff is Desmond J. Leslie Esquire, sheriff for North Strathclyde, who wrote this decision in 2011, and many of you uh, probably know the story. And now I'm going to be a terrible presenter and... and disrespectful because I can't remember the poor deceased woman's name. But someone might be able to help me out here. Anyway, she's in Strathclyde. And the story is, 
It's a terrible failing of mine. I'm terrible on names. I can remember all sorts of details. And I always forget names. So I, I don't mean disrespect to her, but perhaps it's best if we don't mention her name anyway, given this is being streamed and will no doubt be uh, on a website. Anyway, the story is she goes to visit a friend. And she has tea or whatever she has with the friend and she's walking home. And between her and her friend's place, she basically crosses open ground. And that open ground is riddled with disused coal mines that nobody knows they're there or where they are. They're not mapped. And she steps on what's meant to be the cover that after however many years has failed and she falls. And sometime later, the family think, gee, mum should have been home by now. I wonder what's gone wrong. We'll go looking. And they head off across between their house and the friend's house, knowing that's where she's been. And they hear her calling out. Hello, mum. You appear to have fallen down a coal mine. This can't be good. So they do what any... Uh, the right thing. They ring the emergency services. And the fire and rescue service come. And the firefighters who turn up, being the sort of people firefighters are, go, yeah, we can get her out. We can do this. No drama. And they start setting up equipment to use for the rescue. And the equipment they've got has been issued to them as Safe Work at Heights kit, not rescue kit. But they're pragmatic. Problem solvers, <laughs> we can swing this. We know how to set this up. This will work a treat. And a senior firefighter turns up on the scene, and he's not there to be in charge. He's actually going to be the media liaison. But he turns up, and he sees what's going on. A firefighter has already been lowered down into the hole and is sitting with the injured woman. A paramedic is being tied up to be lowered down. The paramedic has done no enclosed, no enclosed space training, no rope training, no relevant training at all. But he said, I'm happy to go down there and see what I can do. And the other firefighters are working out how they're going to hoist this woman up on this kit. And this senior officer looks around, says, I'm the senior ranking officer, walks up to whoever's in charge and says, I'm taking charge and you're not doing any of that. We're not putting this paramedic down that hole, and you're not using that kit to winch this woman out because we've actually got an edict that says this is not to be used for this purpose. It is not safe and efficient and designed for this purpose. They are specifically told in some health and safety document, do not use this kit for this purpose. That is not what it's for. It's not to be done. And he says, we're not doing it. Over the course of the next several hours, a couple of other firefighters turn up and take on the role of incident controller, and they all confirm that decision. We're not dropping this paramedic down the hole, and we're not using this kit. What we're doing is ringing the Strathclyde Police Mountain Rescue Squad. Why? Because someone's looked up the book and says the appropriate rescue squad for this type of job is them. Much debate and ultimately whether this was a vertical rescue or a uh, collapsed building rescue and therefore who, were, who was really in charge. Um, that's not the important point because that, that had nothing to do with firefighters. That had whether the fire brigade had really thought about it. But the firefighters on the scene are told, you are not going to do it. So what happens is the Strathclyde Police Mountain Rescue Squad show up. Much to the surprise of the firefighters, it turns out they've got exactly the same kit as the fire brigade and exactly the same training, and they're going to do just what the firefighters were going to do seven hours earlier. And everyone goes, yeah, we were going to do that. And the tragedy is, as she's brought to the top, she suffers a cardiac arrest and dies because she's been lying at the bottom of a coal mine for about seven hours in this much water and she's got hypothermia. And uh, from my first aid training, once you're hypothermic, you know, it doesn't take much. You have a cardiac arrest and she died. And as the coroner said, she died from, from non-life-threatening injuries. So we have a coroner's inquiry. And the coroner is critical. The coroner is, is outraged that the incident controller says, that was a great rescue. 
We did exactly what we were meant to do and we managed not to kill any of our people. We followed the rules exactly. The rules said it wasn't our rescue. You can debate about that, but you know, that's a matter between the police and the fire brigade, not me as I see. I'm the incident controller, according to my book, this is not our rescue. This is a vertical rescue, it's, you know, it's not a collapsed structure, it's not urban search and rescue. The, the appropriate squad was the police, we called them, and I made sure that none of my troops went down there and died, and I made sure that an untrained paramedic didn't go down there and die. You know? Did a great job. The coroner didn't buy that argument, the coroner was pretty darn critical. And the coroner talked about things like risk management. What's really important, said the coroner, is in these sorts of things, is in any risk management, is weighing the potential cost against the potential benefit. And what was on issue here was um, someone's life. And so, you know, we need to be a bit more flexible. We need to think about it a bit more. Just because you followed the rules isn't good enough. And so he makes recommendations about flexibility and uh, um, conducting risks assessment and ex taking acceptable risks. Because remember, what the coroner wants to do is make recommendations to ensure that the next person in that poor woman's position doesn't die. But of course, he doesn't have to address what had happened if one of the firefighters had died, because they didn't. Not his issue. So then we have the death of Michael Wilson. And again, I, I don't mean to be in any way disrespectful to Michael Wilson. Um, I didn't know him, but I know lots of people who did. Um, and he was a dedicated and um, very effective and very highly trained New South Wales ambulance paramedic. And on Christmas Eve, must have been 2013, Christmas Eve, a person is out bushwalking in the New South Wales Blue Mountains and they fall and they injure themselves. It's not life-threatening, but they're stuck. It's Christmas Eve. I suppose you could, or the various rescue authorities could have called out, because they're the sort of people who do this sort of thing, the New South Wales State Emergency Service. In which case you would have had a whole stack of volunteers traipsing off into the bush and spending Christmas Eve and Christmas Day wandering down there, putting this person on a stretcher and getting them out. And Michael Wilson and his colleagues are on the helicopter rescue service. And they fly out there. And it's getting marginal. It's getting, you know, the, the out light, you know, visual is getting marginal. You know, if we leave this much longer, we can't do it. But they say, I reckon we can do this. And they're going to use a bit of kit, not quite the way it was designed to be used. And not quite, uh, you know, according to the royal rules. But they reckon we can get this person out of here and we can all be home on Christmas Eve. Now, I'm not sure that that was really a driving force, but it seems to me it probably had something to do with it. Anyway, long story short, Michael Wilson gets lowered down, puts the patient into the stretcher. Something goes wrong. Nobody ever quite worked out what. The stretcher with Michael Wilson attached to it slams into the side of the rocks. The helicopter crew know something's gone wrong. They lower him down. They cut the wire. They fly out. The story is that Michael Wilson stayed with reassuring that patient that he was going to be okay, the patient was going to be okay, while he died. You know, don't worry, mate, they'll come and get you, you'll be okay, as he died. And there's a coroner's inquest. And what does the coroner say? Well, what were they doing using this kit in a way that wasn't designed to? You've got to have rules that say, if you've told people not to use it, that they absolutely don't do it that way. Perhaps what we need is to make sure that there's a senior officer on scene who can immediately go, no, no, you're not doing that. And this idea of a risk assessment, because you know what the paramedics did in that job? They did a risk assessment. And they went, I reckon the risk of anything going wrong here is pretty low. And we're going to save this guy. Because if they'd come up with any other risk assessment, they wouldn't have done it. Right? If they'd thought, actually, we're going to die, they'd have gone, I don't think we'll do that. We'll do something that won't kill us. So the New South Wales paramedics, Michael Wilson, did exactly what the Scottish coroner wanted rescue people to do. He was flexible. He thought about the problem. He thought about the benefit to the patient, and he thought about the risk. 
We can get this person out. It's a low risk event. We can all be out of here and we can go home. And he died. So the coroner made recommendations that the New South Wales Ambulance should behave just as the Strathclyde Fire and Rescue Service did. You've got to stick entirely to the rules. You don't just let the crew do it. You make sure you send out a senior officer who's going to take a supervisory approach. So if you follow the recommendations from Jay Leslie Esquire, you kill Michael Wilson. And if you follow the recommendations from this coroner, you kill the poor woman in that one. Why? Because a coroner's inquiry is looking at this death. What I think this coroner, the New South Wales coroner, completely failed to do was actually ask, why do the paramedics do this sort of thing? Think about the culture of the place. Think about the sort of people who become paramedics and firefighters. They, they want to be, you know, they're, they're do sort of people. They're not likely to stand around. They're used to dealing with incredibly complex, variable situations, having to make decisions on the run. They want to get in there and help people. Um, the sort of person who becomes a, a helicopter paramedic is probably, you know, a bit of an adrenaline junkie. So they like a bit of action. And none of that gets brought out in the coroner's inquiry. And you come up with a whole lot of recommendations with respect that, that just, as I said, you follow these ones, you kill the lady in this one. You follow these ones, you kill Michael Wilson. Which raises the point, what do you do with these things? How useful are these recommendations? You know, were they diligently followed? Well, you're only solving one problem. And as I say, and I want to come back to it, I think, particularly in this New South Wales case, what they failed to even begin to consider was the culture of the thing. How many times has this sort of stuff been done? And how much reward does a paramedic get who gets home and says, that only took us an hour because we took a couple of shortcuts because we could see what we're going to do and we did it. And everyone goes, you're a champion. That's exactly what we like. You know, you're a great guy. And he was, you know. And again, I don't mean any respect to him. Everyone tells me who knew him that he was, he was a fantastic guy and a fantastic paramedic. And I don't mean to in any way suggest anything other. But there's a culture in these sorts of institutions. That the, that the person who sees the problem, comes up with a solution and gets it done, is rewarded, right? They get accolades from their teams. The one who says, actually, there work health and safety regulations, so we're not meant to do that. In fact, Rule 23 says that if we, you know, is not the hero back at the fire station or ambulance station. So there's an example, if I might suggest, of if diligently following the inquiries might not help. Now, I was talking about coroners and royal commissions, and, uh, and another point I wanted to make about them, and coroners did it, <clears throat> and I said that being blaming people doesn't help. Well, the other thing these institutions tend to become is very adversarial, even when they say they're not going to be. They all start with this oh, this inquiry is not here to assign blame or legal responsibility. What we're going to do is determine the truth and uh, so everyone can be heard and then it promptly falls back into examination and cross-examination. And why does it do that? Well, uh, if I can be so bold, going back to where I started about my own role in the legal profession, I think it's my professional brethren. You put a judge on top of one of these things or a coroner who is often a judge, depends on how your jurisdiction's st structured, um, but generally a lawyer, um, and you put lawyers in, fr in front of them to run it, and lawyers will behave like lawyers do. So all the lawyers might turn up representing the various fire authorities and ambulance authorities and local authorities, in your case, your Category 1 and Category 2 responders, but they fundamentally know that they have a client who has interests, and part of their job is to protect their client's interests. And they're used to doing examination and cross-examination, so they fall back on old habits because old habits work. And the judges are used to that. Yeah, this is how it all works. So we fall into old habits and we become very adversarial. But adversarial inquiries hurt responders. Oh, look. Many emergency responders experience the review process as more taxing than the critical event itself, so says those people. And that's also reflected in some research uh, that Dover's an idea and which is published in the International Journal of Wildland Fire. That the whole process itself is, is damaging. And for countries like Australia that depend so much on volunteers, that's a problem. And there are some other problems with adversarial type inquiries. Witnesses don't get to tell their story. No one puts a witness in the witness box and says, Tell me what happened. Right? Rule number one of advocacy training. 
right? The witness's job is to answer the questions and your job as the lawyer is to decide what questions you're going to ask them. And you ask the questions to get the story that you want to make the submissions on, not the story that they might want to tell. All right? So they don't get to tell their story and they don't get to be heard. The 2009 Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission, to its credit, did actually make efforts to interpose. During days of hearings, they would take a break and they would invite someone to come in and just tell their story. But the someone was never the responders. Right? The responders' story was told by their chief officers who had gone in and were being given evidence and being very seriously grilled. So just to give one example that came to me as I read some of these stories of a woman who was telling the story about how the fire was approaching their house and no one gave any warnings. Nobody came and told them. If I remember correctly, you know, she could see the fire trucks, but no one came to her house. And that was distressing. And what I've always wondered was, I wonder how much it would have helped if one of those firefighters could have said to her, yeah, of course we didn't. We were trying, you know, but we were dealing with this and we were dealing with that and that's what was happening. And it was our houses burning down too. But that story doesn't get told because the fire brigade story comes through the chief officer in examination in chief. So some people got to tell their story, but not everybody. Affected communities don't get to negotiate sense making from the event or consider implications for a future. What I mean by that is, at a royal commission or a coroner's inquest, the lawyers decide what questions to ask, decide what evidence to lead, then make submissions to the bench, this is the sort of recommendation you should make, Your Honour. The inquiry then produces a big long report that tells communities this is what you need to do. And those communities might go, oh, we agree with that or we don't. So again, if I can draw on the 2009 Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission, which came up with this lovely statement that's well and truly engrossed into Australian policy now about shared responsibility. Emergency management is a shared responsibility. They didn't actually say what, how it's to be shared or who it's to be shared with. But it's not something that the community came up with, it's something they've been told. It's a shared responsibility. Um, so there's no ownership of the recommendations. Finally, uh, there you go. Responsibility is allocated, not negotiated, and accepted. So people are told what your responsibilities are going to be. You're responsible for this, we're responsible for that. Yeah. One of my arguments would be that, again, if you're doing an inquiry across the state of Victoria or a region of the United Kingdom, how you might share responsibility or how you might perceive the impact of the event or how it impacted your community will be different at each community. So every little town that burned out in Victoria did not have the same experience as the other ones. But you get the recommendations from the Royal Commission. A one size fits all. So they're my, in my, it's taken me most of my time, my criticisms of the system. And what I want to suggest to you is what we need is a safer way. And what I mean by safer is safer responders. So responders feel that they can turn up and tell their story and explain what happened and not be blamed for it. They need to be able to say, which at the moment they tell me they can't say, things like, I didn't really know what to do, but I had to make a call. Or, you know, actually, you're right. It was going completely pear-shaped. We were trying our best and things were going wrong. And I guess in retrospect, I might have done it differently. Time for another story? I'm just going to check my slides because it was probably going to come up later, but I can throw it in now. Yeah, yeah, it would have fitted later, but I'll tell it now because it's a good story. 2003. There's been about 10 years of drought in Australia. I was listening to the news the other day. It hasn't rained in Scotland for 18 days, you know, and people are getting really worried. I said, 18 days? It hasn't rained for 18 days? We go for 10 years without rain, you know, really. <clears throat> My daughter went to Glasgow apparently uh, about two days ago and came home early because apparently she said to someone, it's just, you know, it does not stop raining. And they said, you, you are in Scotland, you know. And she went, well, in that case, I'll catch the train back to Newcastle. Anyway, but I digress. I digress. 2003, 10 years of drought. You know, you've got 10 years of drought 
in one of the most arid countries in the world and a bushfire starts. I mean, do you really need a royal commission to go, what caused the start of the fire? Well, actually, it was really dry and there was lightning and it's the Australian bush. Not quite sure how much more learning we need, but fair enough. <clears throat> and so we have an operational review into the 2003 Canberra fires. Great example of resilience, I think, though people don't tend to buy my story. These fires burnt into Canberra, the Australian capital territory, the, the national capital. Killed four people, burned out, I think, about 200 houses. The national capital didn't blink an eyelid, right? And that's resilience, isn't it? The government just kept functioning. The national capital kept functioning. That's resilience. We had this major fire going on. There's responding going on. There's lots of tragedy going on. The wheels of government kept turning because the national capital, and it seems, strikes me that that's an incredible example of resilience. But again, people don't always buy that because, you know, people died and houses were lost. Well, that's tragedy, but it is Australia. Anyway, again, I digress. The gist of the story is that on the night that the fires start, uh, a woman from the parks service is called up as the incident controller because the fire starts in a national park, so it's the park service problem. If it goes out of the park service, it becomes the fire service problem. But it starts in the park, so she's the incident controller. But she and the, the park service and the fire brigades all work very closely together, no drama. And they have to make a decision. Do we send firefighters in tonight or do we not? And for a variety of reasons, they decide we're not going to. This fire is burning way out in the bush. Um, Australia depends in, you know, so significantly on volunteer firefighters. You're going to put a whole lot of firefighters in who've just spent a day at work and you're now asking them to do effectively another shift. We'll tell them all to go home, get a good night's sleep, we'll fight this fire tomorrow. Uh, the next day, they're rethinking it, they've got their appliances and they go, right, where are we going to try and stop this fire? And there's a, a line, a ridge where they think they could probably stop it, but the intelligence that ultimately proves to be wrong, but at the time the intelligence is that the fire has already crossed that line. So they go, so we can't use that, we'll set the defensive line up further along. Long story short, the fire escapes, burns into Canberra, does all that damage. There's uh, an operational review. There's a very, very bitter coronial inquest that ends up in the Supreme Court three times with people challenging the way the coroner is running her inquiry. Um, she makes damning recommendations against the chief minister and the leaders of the Emergency Services Bureau. Um, uh, and then there's litigation that goes on for 10 years. 10 years. The judgment came down almost 10 years to the day after the fire. And his honour, his honour, the judge, found that the incident controller was negligent in a couple of her decisions. And he took satisfaction, or part of his finding was that she conceded um, that, you know, they weren't the best decisions, fundamentally. Things didn't work out the way she hoped they were going to work out. To which it's always struck me as a tad unfair, I say, being polite. Because, of course, if you put someone in the witness box over 10 years and can say to her, well, you know now that the fire behaved like this and you know now that it did that and you know now that 200 homes were burned out and four people died, would you have made it a different decision? Well, of course she's going to go, yeah, well, absolutely. Absolutely. But that's hardly a fair way to judge her decision on the day. Um, and my point of telling you that is, is why we need a safer way, right? And that was litigation. But the same thing with inquiries. Firefighters, responders need to be able to say, they need to be able to express their own doubts. We've been having another coronial inquiry in, uh, in Australia. You may have heard of the Lint Cafe siege, terrorism event in Sydney. You know, going through the police response absolutely second by second. Um, and they wanted to get hold of the police officers' notebooks that they'd been doing in their debriefing. And ultimately, they would, the, coroner, the coroner was refused access to those, or she, the coroner declined to look at those documents on that basis, that if they, people thought those were going to be subject to the coroner, they're not going to write down their own, I didn't really know whether this was a good idea, I didn't really know what was going on, you know, I had to make a call, I had a number of options. But we need people to be able to say that, because surely that's part of the lesson learning, to go, where was the confusion? Where was... So we need a way to allow that to happen. We need it to be for communities because if we keep going through the system of as soon as we can find the right person to blame and sack them, you'll be safe. 
We know that's not true. We need it to be safer for communities so communities aren't surprised when there's the next fire or flood. They go, yeah, we kind of knew that was going to happen because it had happened before and we've had an inquiry and we've all talked about it. We know what that might mean. So what we want, we might say, is to allow everyone to come together to resolve collectively how to deal with the aftermath, to look forward, not backward. So here's, in fact, the thesis as we get to the... Uh, I'm not, the timetable said 9.30, but I gather we had some discussions that that may have been a mistake. But uh, that's what I'm running to. Yeah, I'm just going to keep going. So here's, here's our theory. So what, so what have we thought about? Well, what we said is maybe there's something to be learned about the way the civil aviation industry conducts uh, inquiries. They're definitely a no fault, no blame. Things can't be used against you. Um, without going into the details, we went through that and went, no, there's not a lot of hope. That's not really going to be much different. And we wondered about the medical profession, which these days goes through what's called open disclosure. You know, if they muck up, they're meant to come up pretty much straight forward and go, look, I'm terribly sorry, we chopped off the wrong leg. Uh, you probably noticed that yourself when you woke up, but, you know, we acknowledge that that, that was the wrong leg, um, uh, particularly as you weren't the patient and, uh, you know, we were meant to operate on your husband, but anyway. <clears throat> and we, again, without going through the details, it's in the discussion paper where we thought, no, that's not really much help. What we came up with was this concept of restorative practices, and let me uh, acknowledge uh, the UK City of Culture, just down the road, where I'm going to be spending some time tomorrow, which has the whole Centre for Restorative Practices and is uh, one of the UK's leading uh, restorative cities. Anyway, I was talking to them that made me... The conversation I was having with some people from there made me think of this and made me go, hang on, this might work here. Restorative practices were developed in criminal law to try and restore communities that are affected by crime. Now, it's not just communities, it's victims of crime and offenders. Because what we know is that if you're a victim of crime, your role in the criminal prosecution is to be a witness. Right? Now, criminal directors of public prosecution are getting better at this, but certainly historically, your role was to be a witness. You were just a witness in the Crown case. The prosecution was the Crown being upset that someone had broken its laws, not that something bad had happened to you. So your job was to come along and give evidence, to answer the questions you were asked, not to tell your story, not to tell about how it affected you, to answer the questions that you were asked, and you were only asked questions that led to evidence relevant to prove that the accused was guilty of the offence. And the accused, and let me tell you this, because I've been a criminal defence lawyer, it was a short and inglorious career, you'll be very pleased that I wasn't acting for any of you, but certainly it's, you know, as a criminal defence lawyer, particularly in children's courts, you realise that what's going on has absolutely no bearing on the accused whatsoever. They're sitting there while you're talking to the bench and asking the witnesses, and they have no idea what's going on. Not a clue. And it's certainly not addressing their offending. It's certainly not addressing anything else. And then they get a sentence, you walk out and they go, what on earth was that about? Oh, well, this is what happened when you're going to jail for two months. All right. Uh, what for? I remember having a client once who said, uh, basically, as I, as I got him off the street, you know, you've really got to come to court. And he called out to his mates and said, I'm going to court. And they said, what for? He said, oh, I don't know. No idea. You know, the link that, that something that had happened, you know, however many months ago was now somehow, was completely beyond him. Had no idea what this was about or what was going on. Certainly wasn't going to stop him being an, off an offender again. And certainly as a lawyer, you go in there and my job is to defend my client, you know, and I know what the laws are and I know what the Crown have to prove and I know how they've got to call their evidence and I'm going to challenge their case because if they can't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, my client's entitled to an acquittal. <clears throat> Question of what my client did just doesn't enter into any of that. Yeah, that's oversimplifying it a bit, but... Anyway, so restorative practices said we've got to have a better way. We've got to make it more victim-centred. We've got to make people who are offenders actually realise what they've done so what we're going to try and do, and there are lots and lots of different practices that fall under the title of restorative practices, but, you know, whether it's uh, getting the victim and the offender to sit in a room and explain to each other what happened and why, because the offender isn't probably really just a callous bastard. You know, there are sorts of things that happened in their lives too, and, but they don't understand the victim, and, you know, does the victim need to understand the offender? No, not necessarily, you know, not their problem, but... Uh, there are arguments. This, this thing helps build communities. And, you know, particularly if the victim can say to someone, look at what you did. Look at the effect you've had. Look at what's happened. Understand this. 
One of the things about restorative practice is to try and move beyond the blame and retribution to forward thinking. Okay, it's happened, it was bad, but how do we make it better? And so maybe offenders have to do some sort of re, re, um, you know, remediation, try and make the world a better place. Um, and, and the victim can contribute to deciding what that is. I, mean, I always think it's interesting when, people, when someone gets sentenced for a serious crime, people go, oh, that's not enough. And you go, well, how much would be enough? You know, we're never going to come up with a sentence where a victim of crime goes, oh, yeah, no, that was all right. I didn't mind getting beaten up if they got that sentence. It's not a price. You can't negotiate a price where the victim goes, oh, no, that's all right. So no sentence will ever be enough, right? If you've been the victim of a serious crime, no matter what the offender gets, you're never going to go, oh, yeah, no, that's a fair cop. You're going to go, I just wish this hadn't happened. This should never have happened. I'm still hurt. I'm still damaged. So restorative practices are trying to get to, well, instead of just trying to decide what the punishment is to the offender, what can we do to make it better? And there are examples these days of moving it beyond the criminal law. So we have the Nova Scotia Home for Coloured Children Restorative Inquiry. And we've just recently, you know, like while I've been over here, had massive floods in Australia again. And currently, uh, and I'm watching it from a distance, people are going out, in fact, uh, commissioned by the State Emergency Service and having community meetings where they're sitting down with the people who are there and the responders and going, what happened? What was your experience? What was your experience? What do you think we could do differently this time, next time? And if you can get that message in this town, it may not be the same as the next one. But everyone's getting get, get to have their say. And our theory is if you want shared responsibility and you have that sort of meeting, then maybe the residents will go, OK, we can see that and we can understand the limitations of... Um, in Australia, it would be the state services. In, in your context, it's, you know, you're, you're more regional, um, though you have more people in your regions than we do in our states. So. You know, but whether it's Hampshire Fire and Rescue or New South Wales Fire and Rescue, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> um, if they can sit down and go, well, in this community we're going to do it this way and in this community it's this, and we, um, you can actually get ownership of the problem, is the theory. So. Du -du 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 -du. There's another thing which is just a bit of an, uh, you know, a segue, but I thought it was important, and we put it in our discussion paper because we think it's important, which is this is all well and very good, but you also need to address compensation. I'm not telling anybody in this room I wouldn't have thought anything new if I say disasters are a product of choices. The hazard's the hazard. The fire, the flood, the rain, the storm, whatever it is. The hazard's the hazard. What makes it a disaster is the choices we make about where we're going to build, how we're going to build, how we're going to respond, how much money we're going to invest in preparation and response. Um, you know, as I say, we can make Victoria bushfire proof, you just concrete it, right? It'll never burn again. No one wants to live there. Bugger up the rainfall, apparently. <clears throat> For the first little while, it would improve your caption of the rain, but then apparently the, the, the lack of trees will cause a problem. But it will never burn again. But we, so we make choices. No one wants to live in a concrete of Victoria, so we like to live in it with bushes. And if you're going to live in it with bushes, you're going to get bushfire. And we can't afford a thousand Ericsson sky cranes, so they're going to come. So we make choices about land use, we make choices about funding. And so when we're overwhelmed and when the disaster happens, it's not just an act of God. It's not just a fault of the incident controller that didn't make the right decision. It's a reflection of all our collective choices. Now, most of the time we can fund it, but if all our collective choices create the event that we simply can't deal with, as they inevitably will, there will always be the bushfire we can't put out. There will always be the flood we can't avoid. There will always be your floods. Um, and even terrorism, you know, we could... You want to prevent terrorism, you lock up every male person between about 12 and 40, and we're not prepared to do it. And what we know is litigation is incredibly expensive, time-consuming. This is where I was going to tell my 10-year story, and damaging. And what does it add? Again, we wrote a paper where we looked at the outcome of the Canberra bushfires litigation and looked at all the inquiries and said they spent 10 years. Did they actually learn anything new? All that fact-finding in the courts. Because here's an interesting thing you may not know, is that royal commissions and coroners and things aren't bound by the rules of evidence. So evidence given in those things is not admissible in court. So you go through the royal commission and then someone's got to go give litigation, you've got to go give the same evidence again. 2009 Victorian bushfires litigation running about those fires. And uh, it ended up in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, uh, sorry, the Supreme Court of Victoria. 
There's a process called discovery. In discovery, you've got to share with each other all the documents you have that are relevant. And you can have fights about whether it's relevant or not. Do I have to show you this or do I not have to show you this? And so the judge who's going to hear the case has an associate judge. And he wants the associate judge to deal with the discovery. But how does the associate judge know what's relevant or not, unless there's the issues between them? The judge made a shocking suggestion. He suggested that the associate judge read the Royal Commission report, because that would help her to understand what all the issues were. And it ended up in the court on the question of whether or not the associate judge would be allowed to read the Royal Commission report. And you know who the biggest opponent of the proposition was? It was the state of Victoria, the agency that paid for it. Ultimately, the result was that the judge, the trial judge, promised he wouldn't read it, but the associate judge could read it so she could do the discovery stuff. And the point, of course, to make is that all those people who'd given evidence before that Royal Commission had to do it again. You can't just take the Royal Commission stuff because none of it was done by the rules of evidence. Um, it wasn't designed to determine legal rights. Um, people would have taken different positions if it was a trial, and it wasn't. And so none of the evidence of the Royal Commission was admissible to the extent that the trial judge promised he wouldn't read the report. Because the state of Victoria said, and if you do read the report, we don't admit any of it. We paid $40 million or whatever it was for it. We've adopted all the recommendations. We don't admit that any of it's true. We don't admit that anything that the Royal Commission has said about what happened is actually what happened. We want the right to still litigate it all. And there are still fires there. there are, people are still debating what actually caused them. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so I come back to the Canberra 2003 fires. There were two inquiries and then the litigation. What did it add for 10 years? <clears throat> so I would suggest that if we're going to try and get away from procedures that harm people, um, we need to do that. Oh, and that's the other one. Settlement of liability doesn't actually settle the case. Again, 2009 Victoria, finally all the parties settled. There's a great big settlement scheme. And so if you were a litigant, you might think, beauty, we've settled. But no, no, it just meant who's going to pay the percentages. The litigants still have to produce all the documents and get all the things together to prove their claims, to show that they suffered a loss, blah, 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 thousands of dollars. For what? Anyway, that was, this, this issue wasn't really the theme of our paper, but we didn't think it could not be addressed. So I, I put it in there. So what do we want to do? What we suggest we, the collective we, should want to achieve might be a better heading. We want to achieve an inquiry process where responders aren't victimised by the process, particularly important in the volunteer context, because if we traumatise the volunteers so much, they're just going to stop coming. Right? One day there'll be a fire and then I'll go, I'm happy to turn out and fight a fire for a week. I'm not happy to spend the next 10 years talking about it. So if that's what's going to happen, I'm not coming. That's the fear. And we want one where communities are actually involved in the decision-making process, can come to understand that the hazards are inevitable, that it's the collective choices, and that they might develop ownership in the outcome. And our theory that we're, we're looking for feedback on is that perhaps the restorative type practices might be a way to achieve that better than the adversarial practices of the current Royal Commissions and Coroner's processes. Um, we go into some more detail of what an inquiry under that model might look like and some different themes. I, I don't have time to do that tonight. It's in the discussion paper. Again, it's in some other journal articles um, that we've published about how you might structure these inquiries. <clears throat> but my theme today is, or my invitation to you to think about and comment on is, is, is could we find a more restorative way with that aim of trying to restore communities? When you've had a fire or a flood and people are aggrieved and hurt and think their government failed them and the, the local resilience forum or the fire brigade, whoever it was, failed them because it didn't come to protect them, what you have is, is a ruction in the community. Can we restore it? Would that be a more beneficial process? That's our thesis and that's the question that we've, we're, we're putting out and, as I said, uh, been asking our colleagues in Australia and happy to hear any thoughts you have here. Questions or comments?